best friend Sam was raped by a man that we knew because he worked in the after school program and he held her down with her textbooks beside her and he covered her mouth when he came inside her. So now I'm with Sam at the place with a plan waiting for the results of a medical exam and she's praying she doesn't need an abortion. She couldn't afford it and her parents would like totally kill her. It's 2002, and my family just moved, and the only people I know are my mom's friend Sue and her son. He's got a case of matchbox cars, and he says that he'll teach me to play the guitar if I just keep quiet. And the stairwell of the side, apartment 1245, will haunt me in my sleep for as long as I am alive, and I'm too young to know why it aches in my thighs, but I must lie. I must lie. It's 2012, and I'm dating a guy, and I sleep in his bed, and I just learned how to drive, and he's older than me, and he drinks whiskey neat, and he's paying for everything. This adult thing, it's not cheap. We've been fighting a lot, almost ten times a week, and he wants to have sex, and I just want to sleep, but he says I can't say no to him. This much I owe to him. He buys my dinner, so I have to blow him. He's taken to forcing me down on my knees, and I'm confused because he's hurting me while he says please. And he's only a man, and these things he just needs, he's my boyfriend. So why am I filled with unease? It's 2017, and I lived like a queen. And I follow up damn near every one of my dreams. I'm invincible, and I'm so fucking naive. I believe I'm protected because I live on a screen. Nobody would dare act that way around me. I've earned my protection, eternally clean. Until a man that I trust gets his hands in my pants. But I don't want none of that. I just wanted to dance. And I wake up the next morning like I'm in a trance and there's blood. Is that my blood? Oh, hold on a minute. You see, I've worked every day since I was 18. I've toured everywhere from Japan to Mar-a-Lago. I even went on stage that night in Chicago when I was having a miscarriage. I mean, I tied the piper, I put on a diaper, and sang out my spleen to a room full of teens. What do you mean this happened to me? You can't put your hands on me. You don't know what my body has been through. I'm supposed to be safe now. I earned it. It's 2018, and I've realized that nobody is safe long as she is alive. And every friend that I know has a story like mine. And the world tells me we should take it as a compliment. But then heroes like Ashley and Simone and Gabby, Michaela and Gaga, Rosario, Ali, remind me this is the beginning, it is not the finale, and that's why we're here, and that's why we rally. It's Olympians and a medical resident, and not one fucking word from a man who is president. It's about closed doors and secrets and legs and stilettos from the Hollywood Hills to the projects and ghettos when babies are ripped from the arms of teen mothers and child brides cry globally under the covers who don't have a voice on the magazine covers. They tell us, take cover. But we are not free until all of us are free. So love your neighbor. Please treat her kindly. Ask her her story and then shut up and listen. Black, Asian, poor, wealthy, trans, cis, Muslim, Christian, listen, listen, and then yell at the top of your lungs, be a voice for all those who have prisoner tongues. For the people who had to grow up way too young, there is work to be done. There are songs to be sung. Lord knows there's a war to be won. From the age of 12, we were told that if boys pulled our hair or poked us with pencils, it meant that they liked us. But we didn't like it that much. We were 13 years old when we would walk down the street and had men look from our feet to our face, and we'd listen as they completely replaced our identity from human to object. As they said cringeworthy things to us, we wanted to run. We were frozen in place, but continued walking fast-paced, turning on whatever sidewalk was closest just to get away, even if it didn't lead us in the way that we were originally going. Because Mama always said, if you see a strange man following you, you go to the other side of the street. And remember, if they ever grab you, scream. And there's something we had to learn at the age of 13, because we are just young fiends. We were spanked by the boys at our school, but it was cool because it just meant we had nice bodies. And they rated our bodies on a scale from 1 to 10. 
And if you were at ten, you would learn to spend your days hearing whistles, purring, and damn girl. Because if you were a damn girl, then that meant you weren't a damn girl at all. You were just a toy label, do whatever you want to me, even though I don't agree. Watch what we wore, because if too much shoulder was showing, we had to change our clothing, because it distracted the boys from their learning. So the only thing that we were learning were tips and tricks to tie up our shirt so that it didn't hang too low, because that would show the guys that we wanted. Because wearing shorts and tank tops meant that we were flaunting it. So when we were 16, we screamed because the men that followed us on the sidewalks finally caught up to us. We quietly said, please don't touch us there. We know we're asking for it by wearing these heels, but we just feel so uncomfortable, so stop. But that meant go. We said no, but that meant yes. So they grabbed us and unzipped our dress. They threw us down where our dignity sank lower than the ground. They hovered over us and we pleaded for them to stop. They got on top and you don't need to know the rest because we're some of the 68% of victims that will never tell a soul. So we'll just grab our dresses and go home, take a few showers and try to get some sleep. In the morning, we will pick out the outfit that is most discreet because we want to make sure that no other man from the street thinks we look sweet enough to want a taste. We want to make sure we are as covered as possible so that our identities are not replaced with walking candy. And we will sit at the back of class where nobody will ask how our weekend was because if they ask, we might just burst into tears. And we will live in fear. We will run home so that we will never see the same men again that wait for us to be alone. We went from little boys poking us to men provoking us. We went from little boys pulling our ponytails to watching the trail of tears fall down our pillow every night because we knew once we fell asleep we would see the men in our dreams, no sorry, nightmares, that caught up to us on the sidewalk that night and left us bare. We went from playing with our toys to being toys ourselves. So boys will be boys and us women will never tell. Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. I had to redo the intro because this video turned into so much more than a review of a documentary. This video became about stories of survivors who have taken their voices back and who have done so much more than they ever thought they could and giving those a voice that no longer can speak for themselves and that their story had ended in tragedy. So today, I'm going to tell you the story of several survivors and victims of teenage sexual assault. Audrey Pott was born May 27, 1997, and was the daughter of Sheila Pott and Michael Lazarin. Michael says that he and Audrey's mother, Sheila Pott, were involved in a relationship for nine years. He said that he and Sheila met at a restaurant and that he had not lived in the area that long. He says that he and Sheila dated for approximately six months while she was going through a pretty messy divorce with Larry Pott. Due to his Catholic religion, he did not feel right dating Sheila while she was still married to another man. So she to he told her that until her divorce was over, he thinks it would be better if they ended the relationship. And once she was fully and legally divorced, they could resume their relationship. Michael says that as soon as he and Sheila split up, that she then once again went back to Larry Pot. He alleges that close to a year later, he had called Sheila's office to speak with her and this is when he is told by someone at her office that she is on maternity leave he says that his stomach immediately hit the floor adding up the dates and just that gut feeling he knew that this child was his he says that he contacted sheila's mother and that she informed him that he was not audrey's father and that yes she had had a child, and it was a girl. Michael says that when Audrey was five months old, he received a call from Sheila Pot stating that she was in a very abusive relationship with Larry and that she was tired of it, and she was finally leaving him. She then asked him if he would like to come over and meet his daughter, Audrey. 
So Audrey was five months old when Michael finally got to meet her. He says they then formed a family dynamic. He says that he potty trained Audrey. He done all the things that a father does for his child. I lived in the Rose Garden in San Jose. And um, so for from the five months till Audrey was seven years old, we acted as a family in every way you could possibly imagine. I, you know, I raised my daughter. I potty trained my daughter. I did her laundry. I did everything that any father, loving father, would do for his daughter. Michael alleges that on December 12th, 2002, he and Audrey were trimming the Christmas tree as they did every year. And that Audrey informed him that her mother had been taking her to another man's house. And that this man had three children and Audrey wasn't very fond of these three children. So when Sheila called that night at 1 a.m., Michael informed her that he knew that she was in a relationship with another man. She then told him that she was coming to pick up Audrey. Michael says that Sheila was very intoxicated and he informed her that if he, she showed up at his house, he would be calling the cops on her. Every year me and my daughter would trim a Christmas tree at my house and I was trimming the tree with my daughter and then she started telling me all these disturbing things um, uh, that her mom was taking her to some other man's house and that she, they have three kids. He has three kids that she doesn't like that. Um, and, and that's when I found out, right, it was right before Christmas that her mom was basically seeing another man. And it wasn't Larry Pot. It, it was a boss, it was her boss at the bank. And it just so happens that she was at her company Christmas party. And, um, she called me about one o'clock in the, in the morning, extremely intoxicated, telling me she's coming to pick up Audrey. And I was like, you come to my house, I'm calling the police on you. You are not picking up my daughter intoxicated and um and then i told her audrey told me everything that was going on and i just told her come monday morning i'm going to hire the best family law attorney i could afford and that i'm going to fight for joint custody of my daughter well the next day uh it was a sunday um sheila shows up with her new boyfriend at my house so she was already trying to provoke me to get into a physical, I, I mean, I, at that time, I had no idea of the silver bullet. I had no idea of anything, but um, she was already trying to set the stages up for me to basically take me down that aisle, which I didn't do. Right. This was when Michael started his years and years long battle to try to get custody of his daughter. He says that he spent over $250,000 in family court to try to get custody of his daughter. Then one day his lawyer called him and told him to come into the office. This is when Michael found out that Sheila had never divorced Larry. That the whole nine years that they were together, Sheila and Larry were still married. They were only legally separated. And in the state of California, I know it's like that as well in the state of Virginia and Tennessee. If you are married and you have a child, your husband's name goes on the child's birth certificate until a DNA test is done and proven otherwise. But in the state of California, the statute of limitations to prove a child's mother or father by DNA is two years. And Michael had missed this limitation by five years. The time that I was with, the nine years I was with Audrey's mom, there was never a divorce. It was all fabricated. So, and he told me we're in trouble. So I find out in the state of California, you only have two years in statutes of limitations in order to do DNA testing. And um, he told me I had less than a 50% chance to win and get custody of my daughter. And I said, well, 50% is better than no percent. So went through the whole thing of years of litigation and family court um, the judge ended up ruling against me because of the statutes of limitations um, she did demolish uh, uh, she did during her one you know they, they basically legally kidnapped my daughter from me mm -hmm. 
And then from seven years old, um, the ironic thing when I'm in family court, um, obviously she's still technically married. So my attorney had to serve Larry, Larry, Larry Pot. That was the first time I ever met the man in my entire life. He shows up with my to the proceedings with his new girlfriend, which is now his wife. Her name's Lisa Pot, and she's pregnant with two twin daughters. So they basically strip me from all of my parental rights at when my daughter was seven years old, they granted it to Larry Pot. He received child support from the mother, along with some other major fight. Living in a multi-million dollar home, getting child support from my daughter with this new woman and wife. And, and then they started basically um, the parental alienation. They started... Um, telling my daughter she has no family, no grandma and grandpa in Arizona. Um, so my daughter started getting this uh, brainwashing techniques constantly. So from the age of seven, Audrey's parents, Larry and Sheila Pott, along with Lisa Pott, her stepmother, shared custody. And Audrey grew up in Saratoga, California. Saratoga is tucked away in the foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Saratoga is a residential community of almost 30,000 citizens, but still with a small town feel. Saratoga is also known for its wineries, high-end restaurants, and many people move to Saratoga to live the retired life and residents tend to lean more to the liberal political side. Saratoga's school system is also highly rated. Saratoga is the 29th richest neighborhood in the United States and ranked among the best educated cities in California. Saratoga is 66% safer than other cities in America. The estimated Household income in Saratoga is over $200,000. Audrey attended Saratoga High School, which is a top-rated public school with around 1,500 students per year. Saratoga is home of the Falcons, sporting the colors of red, black, and white. Audrey was described as having a keen sense of humor, a kind heart, a deep passion for her friends and family. She was a great student, was into sports, especially the color guard that had marched in Obama's inauguration parade and was also heavily into soccer. She had a thick outer shell that was hard to penetrate. Audrey was also very self-conscious about her appearance. Her mother says that Audrey would put on a sports bra and then her cami and then a t-shirt on as well and then bend over in front of the mirror to make sure that nothing was showing before she would leave the home. Audrey was excited for her sophomore year of high school. Audrey's friend Amanda, since the sixth grade, says that as young as middle school, they were asked for nudes from boys in their class who had created a special Yahoo account to post these nudes and pass around. Even though Audrey was approached almost daily Due to Audrey being very well developed for her age by boys who would practically beg her for these pictures, she always turned them down. She wasn't that type of girl, and she valued her reputation very much. After school began, Audrey started her sophomore year hanging out with a girl named Emily. Now, Emily always hung out with an older group of friends like seniors and juniors, and Audrey thought this was cool. So this was one thing that attracted her to Emily. One weekend, while Emily's parents were out of town, her and Audrey decided to have a party at Emily's house. This party would take place on September the 3rd. Sorry guys, I had to put my hair up. It's getting a little warm in here. Let's keep going. On September 3rd, Audrey is seen on social media posting pictures, getting ready for her first ever party. She is so excited that she can hardly contain herself. Later, during the night, Amanda and Kathy, Audrey's long-term friends, decided to attend the party. 
Amanda says that as soon as they walked into the party that they felt very awkward. They said that Audrey was very drunk, which was out of the ordinary for her. Audrey was making out with her friend Kathy's crush, which it was not like Audrey to ever want to hurt any of her friends. One of the defendants in the Audrey Pot case said it was also one of his first parties. That when he walked in, he seen kids with their hand down each other's pants. He said there was a lot of underage drinking. He seen a lot of kids giving each other hickeys. He said that it was unlike anything he had ever seen before. He said that he had actually drove a lot of his friends to the party and this made him feel cool in some way. Audrey's friend Amanda says that after Audrey got to a point to where it was clear she was just way too intoxicated that Amanda and Kathy had tried to take her upstairs to get her to sleep it off but Audrey had fought them telling them that she wanted to go back downstairs and after that Amanda and Kathy decided it was time for them to leave the party. They were just way too uncomfortable because of the things that were going on. And Amanda said that because that Emily was there and it was at Emily's house that she thought Audrey would be fine. Now to start, we're going to go over the events that happened from Audrey's point of view. September 4th, the next morning, Audrey woke up with no recollection of the night before and was covered in marker in very inappropriate places. Half of her face had been colored in. She had writing on her breast, her vagina, near her vagina, down her legs. Audrey quickly tried to clean it off as much as she could. When Sheila Potter arrived, she said she immediately seen a green line drawn down Audrey's leg. She had asked Audrey what that was, and Audrey had shrugged it off saying someone had played a practical joke on her and that it was no big deal. Audrey was the type of girl who liked to deal with things on her own, and she started her own investigation to find out what had happened. She actually had texted her friend Amanda and said that she was terrified that she had done something that she did not want to do. But Audrey was also bombarded by message after message calling her name, saying very explicit things to her. Audrey was being messaged awful things by people that she thought were her friends. And to Audrey, in her mind, her reputation was tarnished and she would never get it back. No one would ever think of her the way they had before. September 5th, Audrey went to school the next day. She knew it was going to be hard, but she was ready to face everyone and she was ready to get to the bottom of what had happened. But Audrey was harassed and slut shamed all that day. That was the day that Audrey had found out about the photos that had been taken of her and the extent of what had been done to her. They had all turned their backs on her. Wednesday, September 6th, Audrey didn't want to go to school. She had told her mother that she didn't feel good, but she looked concerned about Audrey's grades, called Larry. Because it was his day with Audrey and they all met up at a coffee shop to speak with Audrey. They asked her what was going on, why she didn't want to go to school. But Larry says that he was stunned when Audrey broke into tears and told them that she wanted to switch schools. They had continued to speak with Audrey and they hadn't made her go to school that day. But later that day, Audrey decided to hang out with Emily, her friend, and Audrey was convinced that a boy that she knew was the one that took the photos. No one would come out and straight up tell her what happened. She knew everyone knew, and even kids at other schools knew, and she knew that it would only keep spreading, that it would never stop. September 10th, her friend Amanda found out she had cut herself, but Audrey told her she had just broke something that was what the cuts were from, and Amanda, even though she was worried, believed Audrey. Somehow, a friend had found out about this event as well and told the whole class, telling the whole class in front of Audrey that Audrey was a cutter. This, on top of everything else, broke Audrey. She called her mother and asked her to please pick her up, that she couldn't take it no more. And Sheila responded with, what do you mean you can't take it no more? She later then picked up her daughter from school. 
She knew that something was wrong with Audrey. But with Audrey, you had to let her cool off before you could talk to her about anything. So Sheila told Audrey to go up to her room and that she would be up in a couple minutes to check on her. Sheila says that 10 or 15 minutes later, she went to Audrey's door and knocked on the door and said Audrey's name, but there was no response. She opened Audrey's door and looked in her bedroom and Audrey was not there. Sheila then went over to the bathroom and that is where she found Audrey hanging by her neck, lifeless. Sheila immediately cut Audrey down from the shower and took the rope from around her neck. She called the ambulance. Once they got there, she kept begging them to please, please save her daughter. To not let her go. Larry Potts said as soon as he found out, he got in the car and rushed to the hospital. But that when he seen his daughter's eyes, he knew that she was gone. Audrey was on a coma and on life support for the next two days. Her family and friends came to say goodbye to her. As she was showing no brain activity, they decided to take her off of life support and let her go in peace. So, Michael Lazarin claims that he had to find out about his daughter's death on Facebook that his sister had called him and told him that she had seen a post about Audrey committing suicide. Now he says that from the other side of Audrey's family he was told that him contacting her and alerting to her that she now had a little brother had sent her over the edge and caused her to commit, to commit suicide. And it wasn't until he seen the Audrey and Daisy documentary that he found out and it wasn't until a few months later that he found out that his daughter actually had committed suicide because she was sexually assaulted. Now, Michael also says that Larry and Sheila did not find out why Audrey had committed suicide until seven months after she had passed away. He also says that the night that Audrey went to the party, Sheila had left her for the weekend unsupervised. He says that the documentary is very misleading about Audrey's life, that there are a lot of other reasons that led to his daughter's suicide. I don't even know if you could call it the stepmother because she's not a stepmother, right? She has no relation to my daughter. She has no blood relation at all zero so um so this lisa pot you know ends up uh just treating my daughter just horribly you know um they took she take they took her door off of her room they had tracking devices on my daughter Look, they were okay. abusing my daughter yeah uh, physically emotionally mentally uh for eight years um Sorry, um, and I and I know this for a fact because I have all the records. I have all my daughter's therapist reports. I have all the police reports. I have every aspect. That's why these people cannot. They will not. You know, in in this court, you know, it took me to the Supreme Court to get justice for my family. He also tried to become a person that was involved in the lawsuit that was filed by Sheila and Larry. He said that he didn't want any money from this. He just wanted the real reason of his daughter's suicide to be known. He claims that the Audrey Pot Foundation is nothing but about the money and that Sheila and Larry have made over two million dollars off of his daughter's death. Now, I'm going to leave the interview with Michael down below, and it is, I've used a few clips from the interview in this video, so go check it out for yourself. Now, Michael has won his case to where he can speak of Audrey, and that he is changing a law to where this is not going to happen to fathers again. 
So he is working on that. Now I know Sheila and Larry had tried to sue him, saying that he could not use Audrey's pictures or her name or what have you. Um, there was a lot of suits that were going back and forth uh, in this big mess. And um, Michael had to take it to the Supreme Court to be able to tell the truth about his daughter's story. And I'm going to let you guys decide what you think is the truth on your own. I'm just giving you the information to ponder on. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you think that Michael is Audrey's biological father or do you think that Larry Pot is Audrey's biological father? In my opinion, my opinion only, I think that Michael Lazarus is Audrey's biological father. Now, I wanted to take the time to add in here that no, I don't think that you have to be a child's biological father to be a father to that child. There are many men raising children that are not their own, that are more of a father than the biological father would have been. But I also believe in cases where the biological fathers that want to be involved are, if it's not in the child's best interest that's fine but if they want to be involved with their child i think that they should be let involved with their child and not be with him audrey pot passed away on september the 12th 2012 the day that audrey passed away the school announced that audrey had passed her friend Kathy then decided to tell the counselor about why Audrey may have committed suicide. And the counselor automatically called the cops and they became immediately involved. They interviewed Kathy to find out what all she knew and what all had happened to Audrey. Meanwhile, Sheila and Larry decided that they would go through Audrey's computer to investigate further, looking into emails, texts, and Facebook messages. And they immediately identify three suspects early on. The suspects are not known due to them being juveniles at the time. The boys say they carried Audrey into the bedroom intending to let her sleep off being drunk. One of the boys, after being told by an officer that they were going to look for DNA, admits that it was all three of them. They had assaulted Audrey. The investigators took their phones and uncovered text and photos of the assault. One detective says that he could never imagine what Audrey was going through. The boys were charged with sexual battery and penetration with a foreign object. The boys admitted to the assault and were found guilty. They were allowed to remain anonymous and at school because it didn't happen at school. Now, I'm going to warn you that hearing what happened to Audrey is not going to be easy. And you can get quite upset and it's very graphic. The boys described that night and they said that one of them had seen some markers and had thought, thought it would be funny to draw on Audrey. After all, she had drawn on him a couple days before while he was sleeping in class. They all say that they did not realize what they were doing at the time was illegal. They began writing words on Audrey. The boy says that they didn't mean any harm but that it was only a practical joke after all. A text later between one of the boys and a friend of his states what went down. And the boy says, you can't tell Audrey I told you, okay? The friend replies, okay. The boy texts back and says, she passed out and we colored half her face black and colored all over her body, like her boob. It said harder on her leg with an arrow to her vagina. And it said anal on her back with an arrow to her ass. And there was this sharpie everywhere. It was so funny. Ha, ha, ha. And the friend replied, Technically, you stripped her and drew everywhere. And he said, Not just me. All the guys did it. The lawyer who is questioning the boys asked what happened next. And he replied, I don't remember. But someone was saying that there was a marker inside of her. And they were telling me to get it. The boys admitted to sexually assaulting Audrey with his finger. 
The attorney goes on to ask another boy what he's seen this boy do. And the boy replied that he's seen him finger Audrey. They then asked this boy if he sexually assaulted Audrey with his finger. And he says yes. Then he was asked why he lied to the cops about it when he was questioned. And he says that he was afraid to get in trouble because his parents and his lawyer weren't there. He was then asked about the pictures taken of Audrey. He was asked how many pictures were taken of Audrey, and he says that he took five to eight pictures, but that he had later deleted them, afraid that he would get in trouble. Now, if you remember, this is most likely after they are spread around the whole school, and one of the texts Audrey asks about the pictures, about the marker, and one of the boys tells her, Don't worry about it, Audrey. You know how it is around here. Everyone will forget about this by next week. He assures her that the pictures are deleted, but Audrey replies, You just have no idea what it's like to be a girl. After Audrey's suicide, the Pot family filed a civil suit against the boys. They said it wasn't about the money. It was about getting justice for Audrey and letting everyone know the truth. For the settlement, the boys were required to verbally apologize in open court on record in front of a judge admitting to their involvement and their part in Audrey's death and assault, as well as a public written apology to the Pot family. They also had to support the petition for Audrey's honorary graduate diploma and give 10 presentations to high school students or youths on issues of slut shaming, sexual assault, posting nudes, and spreading rumors. And to also complete the documentary and do a 45 minute interview with the people who are shooting the documentary. The boys only got 30 to 40 days in juvenile detention for their part in what happened to Audrey. They also did not run con concurrent um, they only had to do weekends until they had pulled the 30 to 40 days. And it was also off record. So no one actually knew what had happened and what they'd done because they were juveniles. But with the civil suit, it was public. So people would actually know. Since Audrey's death, Larry and Sheila have focused on making sure that Audrey is remembered and that no one else has to suffer what Audrey suffered. First, they helped pass Audrey's Law, signed by Governor Jerry Brown, September 30th, 2014, which increases penalties and decreases privacy protections for teens convicted of sex, sexual assault on someone who is passed out from drugs or alcohol or incapable of giving consent due to a disability. Larry and Sheila also started the Audrey Pot Foundation, you can find the link to the Audrey Pot Foundation in the video description below. I urge you to go and take a look at it, see what all they have achieved and are trying to achieve in the future. The Audrey Pot Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization providing anti cyber bullying presentations to schools, art and music scholarships, grants for school therapists, and focusing on sexual assault education and cyberbullying and suicide prevention. They have shared Audrey's story. <clears throat> they have shared Audrey's story with over 35,000 college, high school, and middle school students and are passionate about educating young people about sexual assault by standard intervention and cyberbullying. It is only fitting that Audrey's passing could become a catalyst for change and that her beautiful life she led will continue in her absence to provide a glimmer of hope and love in this world. Now since Audrey's passing as well and since the documentary has aired, that is when the battle between Sheila and Larry and Michael began because he wanted people to know that he was actually Audrey's father and that a lot of things that were presented in the documentary were wrong. Now, I have the link to his interview that he done down below. It's an hour-long interview. He tells what happened from the time that Audrey was born to the time, you know, that she passed away. 
and what happened with all the lawsuits until he won in the Supreme Court. So, you may want to go check that out if you want to look further into that situation. When Michael and Melinda Coleman married, he was an electrical engineer and she was a veterinarian. Michael confided in Melinda and told her that he had always dreamed of being a doctor. So, while Michael done his five years through medical school, his internship, and his residency, Melinda supported the family, and Melinda says that she had kids around every 20 months until they had four children, three boys, and one daughter. Catherine Daisy Coleman was born on March 30th, 1997, and was immediately the apple of her father, Michael Coleman's eye. He was her hero. Daisy says that she thought that nothing could ever happen to her father. She always thought that he was too strong and big for anything to ever happen to him. He was the one who had to rock Daisy to sleep every night and every morning she would crawl into her father's lap while she woke up and started her day. In 2009, Michael, Daisy, and her brother were traveling to her older brother, Charlie Coleman's wrestling tournament and Melinda was following behind in another car. Michael Coleman then hit a sheet of black ice and flipped into a ravine. Charlie Coleman says he can remember sitting in the hospital for hours thinking maybe it would be like a Disney movie and his father would wake up. But unfortunately, Michael Coleman never woke up and passed away. This devastated the whole family. Immediately, Melinda was the sole provider for four young children. Daisy was nine years old when she lost her father, and this hit her probably the hardest due to her being daddy's little girl. The family decided that they needed a fresh start because driving past Michael's practice, seeing it no longer there, and having to drive by the site where he was killed every day was just too hard on them and made it too hard to move on. Melinda said in no way did she want to erase Michael's memory, but she had to move somewhere where her children could finally start healing. And she wanted to move somewhere that wasn't so far away from Albany that they couldn't still see their friends and wasn't too big of a place where it was a total shock to the children. This was when they found Maryville, Missouri. Maryville is a city only an hour from Albany and it was that not so big city they were looking for with only around 12,000 residents tucked into an expansive stretch of farmland along Missouri's northern border. It offered an idyllic setting and it was like many small towns, close-knit with an old-fashioned town square and a passion for high school football. On Fridays, it was as if the town was deserted. Until, of course, you made it to the football stadium where they were cheering on their home team, the Spoof Hounds. The kind of place where downtown values reigned and you couldn't stop by the local A restaurant without running into a familiar face, especially on Sundays where this was a place after church where everybody seemed to go. Charlie Coleman says it was almost a perfect fit, and he was excited to play football for a powerhouse team who had just won state the previous year. Daisy Coleman was the all-American pretty blonde girl. She had participated in many, many beauty pageants growing up, trophies littered her dressers and walls, and I can, you know, kind of relate to this, because growing up in the South, it's kind of a thing, or was a thing, it's not so big anymore, where you knew you were going to participate in pageants. Pageants are a part of what are ingrained to us, and it seems like it, it was the same way in Albany and Maryville, Missouri. Daisy was absolutely beautiful. Blonde hair, blue eyes, everything you would think of when you would think of the All-American Teenage Varsity Cheerleader. 
Now, Daisy was in varsity cheerleading at Maryville High School when she was only a freshman, which is a huge feat to accomplish. It's very hard for a freshman to get onto the varsity team, especially if it's a team who takes it seriously, as I'm sure Maryville did. Daisy was outgoing, funny, and she loved to tell jokes. Daisy says that in Albany, she was kind of an outcast, kind of the oddball, if you will. Daisy was just getting her bearings in Maryville when she caught the eye of a 17-year-old varsity football player, Matthew Barnett. And for a new girl, a young girl at that, at a new school, it was quite flattering to say the least. And made Daisy feel cool in a way that a older, popular boy was paying attention to her. Her only 14 years old and a freshman. Uh, Daisy's best friend, Paige Parkhurst, would spend the weekends with Daisy in Maryville. They would watch movies. They would perform dances. They would just do little girl things that all of us done as teenagers. But on this night, on January the 7th, 2012, the girls had decided that they were going to try and get some alcohol and see what it was like to get drunk for the first time. That night, the girls drank a water bottle full of tequila as well as Red Bull and vodka. Charlie says he remembers this day vividly because this was his first wrestling tournament that he had ever won, and he was very hyped up. He even messaged his best friend, Jordan, to see if he wanted to come over, have a couple beers, and play Xbox. But Jordan had texted him back, telling him that Matthew had already asked him to come over, and he'd already told Matthew he would. So Char Charlie says that he ended up turning in around 10 a.m., thinking, of course, that his sister and Paige were in the room watching TV. Melinda Coleman checked on her daughter around 12 a.m., making sure her and Paige were set for the night and had everything that they needed and that they were okay. Paige says that she eventually became dizzy and felt a little sick, so she laid down to try to get the nausea to go away. Eventually, Daisy had been messaging with Matthew Barnett through the night. Matthew asked Daisy if she would like to come out and hang out and drink a little. Daisy then asked Matthew what he had, and he told her that he had some vodka. Daisy then asked Matt who he was with, and he said that he was with Nick, Zach, and Forney, calling the boys by their last name, as they always done in their sports teams. So Daisy and Matt formulated a plan that Daisy and Paige would sneak out their window and Matt and another friend of his would pick them up. And just after 1 a.m., that's exactly what they done. The girls jumped out the window and beelined it for Matt's awaiting car. Now Paige says that they were dropped off a few houses away that you could tell that Matt didn't want his parents to know that they were there. They said they had to run through a few backyards and then snuck through the basement window. Daisy says there was five boys there with them that night. Matt, Cole, Nick, Jordan, and a younger friend of theirs. These were some of the most popular boys at Maryville High School. Jordan Zach was a Jordan Zach was a top wrestler and an all-state linebacker and tennis player. Jordan's family actually owned the popular A restaurant in town that everyone visited. There was also the 15-year-old who knew the group through an older sibling. Matthew Barnett was a defensive end for Maryville High School's football team, the Spoof Hounds, who came from a prominent Maryville family. His grandfather had been a longtime member of the Missouri House of Representatives. He had a reputation as a guy who liked to have a good time. In fact, when Charlie found out that he was texting Daisy, Charlie warned Daisy to stay away from her. But Charlie said, you know, what 
teenager wants to listen to her older brother. And Daisy and Matt continued to communicate through text. Daisy says even before they left her house that they were already drunk. She says that they were not tipsy or buzzed, that they were drunk, which was hard for her to identify at the time because they had never done it before. So she says that it was kind of like, oh, is this what it's supposed to be like when you're drunk? As soon as the girls entered the basement, they were separated. Paige was pulled into Matthew Barnett's younger sister's room by the younger boy that was there, and Daisy stayed in the main room with the other four boys who were a lot older than her. Daisy says she remembers one of the boys had mentioned that she should drink out of the bitch cup, which was a cup of alcohol, if not fully consumed, made you a bitch. And if fully consumed, you were kind of like a big ass, I'm assuming. What else? I'm not sure what else you would call it. So Daisy, being the only girl with Three brothers never backed down from a challenge, so she grabbed the cup and downed the alcohol that was inside. Daisy says that altogether she probably drank around 11 to 12 shots of liquor. She says the last thing that she remembers is a dog jumping on her lap and her saying something loudly about it, to which the boys shushed her, telling her to be quiet, afraid that their parents would hear them who were upstairs. Daisy says it was that moment that everything went black and she did not remember anything that happened the rest of the night. Now, meanwhile, Paige is alone in the other room with the youngest of the boys. She says that every time he would try to make a move, she would push his hand away and tell him no, but he kept being persistent, trying over and over again until he no longer listened to anything she was saying undressed her, undressed herself, put a condom on, and sexually assaulted Paige. Paige was only 13 at this time. Paige says she made it very clear that she did not want to do anything with this boy. She says that there's a lot that she wishes she would have done more, but she also says that she was scared that if she fought back, what would truly happen to her? She says that she could hear Daisy and the other boys in the other room, but about five to ten minutes later, everything went quiet. And when she came out, she was told by one of the boys to sit on the couch and wait. Paige says that when Matt opened his bedroom door and she went inside, Daisy was laying half on the bed and half off, totally lifeless. That she could not talk, she could not walk, she was absolutely incoherent. And the boys began trying to figure out a way to get her out of their house and back to hers. So they basically just drug Daisy out the window and through the backyards of the neighborhood. And Paige says that Daisy was crying the whole way. Once they got to Daisy's house, they began discussing how to get her into her house because they were afraid of waking her brothers up. Charlie was actually very good friends with a lot of these boys and they in no way wanted Charlie to know that they had been out with his younger sister. They told Paige that they would sit with Daisy while she sobered up to go back in the house and go to sleep. Paige says that she crawled back through the window and basically passed out. The next morning it was 21 degrees in Maryville, Missouri and around 5.30 a.m. Melinda Coleman's stumbled through the house, awoken from a deep sleep by something scratching at the door. She had she had dogs and she was thinking that may have, they may have got outside and wanted back in. Since she made her way to the front door and when she opened the door, her heart dropped. Melinda Coleman discovered her daughter laying on the front porch in only jogging pants and a shirt in and out of consciousness. Her hair was wet and frozen. She immediately carried her inside the house and began trying to warm her up, wrapping her in warm blankets. Melinda said she immediately worried where Paige was. Was she outside? What had happened to her? They went in Daisy's room and discovered Paige in bed to where they woke her up and started questioning her to find out why Daisy had been outside. But Paige says that she was still drunk and confused about everything that had happened.
Charlie, Daisy's oldest brother, began his own investigation. He began searching for Daisy's phone, which was lying next to her shoes on the frozen lawn outside. He dried the phone and opened Daisy's text. Charlie says the first name that he seen on Daisy's text when he pulled them up was the name Maddie B. And Charlie says that he knew it had been Matthew Barnett that had left his sister in her front yard. Charlie became angry when he seen that his teammate Matthew had texted his little sister and asked her to come out with him. He then began trying to get a hold of his best friend Nick who had been at Matt's house the night before. Even driving to Nick's house and texting him from his driveway, Nick would not answer the phone or his door. Charlie says that trying to sleep with Daisy was not something that he would put past Matthew Barnett. He says that one of his friends could have at least texted him and let them know that his little sister was at Matthew's. They could have done something, but instead they done nothing. This was when Charlie told his mother that it was time to contact the police. Melinda Coleman called 911 and she was referred to the Nottaway County Sheriff's Office because she was in the county jurisdiction, not the city. Melinda began to draw a cool bath to help warm her daughter's body up. As a veterinarian, she knew that hypothermia can't be warmed up too fast because it can do damage to the body. She began removing Daisy's clothes and this is when she noticed red marks and other distinguishing features on Daisy's body. That would suggest that something more had happened to her. That it was time to take her to the hospital. At the hospital, Daisy's blood alcohol level was tested, which came back as 1.34. Which had to mean that Daisy was almost comatose, close to blood poisoning level, when she was pushed out of the car onto the lawn that night. After Daisy and Paige endured the humiliating experience of a rape kit where doctors observed small vaginal tears indicative of recent sexual penetration, the Nottaway Sheriff's Office Department started questioning the girls, asking them where they had been and what had happened. The girls, still drunk and confused, tried to give the best account that they could of Darren White was the lead investigator of the case. He is Nottaway County's Sheriff. Darren tells the documentarian that in Nottaway County, there is no force higher than the sheriff. That basically, he is at the top of the food chain. Now, Darren White served two terms in Nottaway County before losing to Randy Strong in 2016 by less than 1,000 votes. You begin to get a feel for Darren right away. He seems to be quite proud of himself and his accomplishments, and as a father of girls himself, you would think that the case with Daisy would have touched him more deeply than it actually did and that his perspective would have been a little different than it was. Darren White is that he had the case practically wrapped up within four hours of it starting. One by one, the sheriff rounded up all the boys involved and brought them in to the sheriff's office, questioning all of them. After talking to the 15-year-old underage boy, who can't, his name cannot be disclosed, but his interview was disclosed, and he told that he had sexually assaulted Paige, that she had told him no, and he had done it anyway. He also told that the boys had put Daisy on the lawn and left her there. Now, Matthew Barnett admitted to having sex with Daisy. He admitted that she had been drinking, and he admitted that Paige was also there. He also tried to say that he did not know how old Paige was, but he did know that Daisy was only 14 years old. He told the sheriff that Daisy had never once told him no, but... In the state of Missouri, there is a law that says anyone 14 and under cannot give consent when under the influence of alcohol. And as well as you have the case of statutory rape, which was never even brought up in this case. Now, Matthew Barnett was arrested and charged with sexual assault, a felony, and endangering the welfare of a child, a misdemeanor. Jordan Zach, who the 15-year-old boy told, filmed the encounter between Daisy and Matthew Barnett. 
was charged with sexual exploitation of a minor. Records show that after initially deciding not to answer questions, Jordan said he had used a friend's phone to record some of the encounter. He said he had thought that both were still clothed, but the 15-year-old said that you could obviously see that they were both naked. Darren White bragged, I would defy the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department to do what we did and get it wrapped up as nicely as we did in that amount of time. Darren, Darren, Darren. You made yourself look like a fool, dude. News of the case spread through Maryville like wildfire. And when it hit the halls of Maryville High School, many took to social media and Facebook. Many took to Twitter and Facebook to make their allegiances known. Making hashtags like Matt1, Daisy0, Daisy is a slut, and so many more. That they went to a dance competition for Daisy and a girl showed up wearing a shirt that said Matt One Daisy Zero, which had, as I said, become a common hashtag that Daisy seen daily. On Charlie Senior Night with the wrestling team, he was booed by some of the students. Some of the comments that Charlie heard being made were that his mother and his sister were crazy bitches and that Daisy had been asking for it. Melinda was actually fired from her job at the South Paul's Veterinary Clinic. Days later, she went in with the recording and asked her boss why she had been fired. When her boss said that the case was just putting too much stress on everybody and that there's going to be times when they probably would have stuff booked and she wouldn't be able to come in. Darren White complains that Melinda Coleman would show up at the sheriff's office or call on a daily basis. He would sit down with her and go over the case and answer her questions, and then the next day, they would repeat the process. He says it was like being in the movie Groundhog's Day. Now, I don't know about you but guys, but if that was my daughter, I would be doing the same things, but this seemed to aggravate Darren. Melinda says that she heard through the grapevine that the following days that calls were being made and the local political ties were calling favors in and that charges would be dropped. She says she tried to ignore them until eight weeks later when she got a call from Paige Parker's mother, who told her that the charges against Matthew as well as Jordan had been dismissed. Melinda was not notified by the district attorney, Rice, at all. There, there was claims that there was no evidence of sexual assault and there was no evidence that the video ever existed, that the video had been deleted and no one had seen it. Darren White even says that if anyone says they'd seen it, they were a liar because once the Apple deletes a video, it's deleted and you can't recover it. That they'd seen it off and tried to recover it and it was impossible. A petition generating more than 1,200 signatures was posted on the website change.org, which I urge you guys to go check out, um, to request an investigation by an Attorney General, Chris Costner. Emails were sent to Jefferson City as well. The office ultimately said it didn't have the authority to review Rice's decision. One of the parents of the boys that were at the home that night stated that their boys deserved an apology, and they still hadn't received it yet. Ross called it a case of incorrigible teenagers drinking alcohol and having sex. They were doing what they wanted to do, and there weren't any consequences, and, and it's reprehensible, but is it criminal? No. The doctor who treated Daisy the following morning called the prosecutor's decision to drop the charges surprising. And one longtime Missouri attorney believes the Coleman status as an outsider played a part in the case's dismissal as well. The fact that the family wasn't from Maryville made it a lot easier for the prosecutor to drop these charges. Paige's mother puts it more bluntly that if it had been one of her sons and her sons would rather cut their hands off than do something like that, but if it had been one of them, they would be sitting in a maximum security prison somewhere doing 25 years. There's no doubt in her mind. But since it was a prominent member of Maryville, nothing had happened to them. Basically, she says the wrong boy 
raped Daisy, as sad as that is to say. For the Colemans, the dismissal of the charges only started the beginning of the end to their life in Maryville. In the days that followed, a new round of videos made its way online. Fuck yeah, that's what you get for being a skank, read one tweet. One of many comments posted publicly. Melinda says the daily harassment became too much. Daisy and Logan transferred to Albany High School, making the 80-mile round trip daily. Initially, Melinda refused to consider leaving Maryville, but altogether, even after her lawyer suggested it might be in the family's best interest, she says that part of her just wanted to be stubborn enough to stay, but she finally knew that it was never going to be okay for her family in Maryville ever again. So they decided to move back to Albany to the house that they had when Michael was alive. That August, Charlie went off to college and the other children went back to Albany High School. The sheriff, of course, has to put his two cents in and says that the family went back to Gentry County where they came from. Even after leaving, however, it wasn't over for them and in Maryville. They still had their home there and had put it up for sale until one Sunday morning when the captain of the fire department got a call that there was a house on fire. It was the Coleman's home in Maryville. The home was deemed unsafe for anyone to investigate until several weeks later an insurance investigator came in and it was heavily investigated by private parties but the captain says that they never heard anything else out of that many in the town were happy to put that episode behind them including sheriff white who doesn't hide his distaste for melinda coleman stating that she is a woman that has clearly got issues he says we did our job he says, we did it well. It's unfortunate they are unhappy. I guess they're just not going to get over it. As he spent time in regular therapy, she had been admitted to Smithville Hospital four times for trying to, to commit suicide. She had also spent 90 days at Missouri Girls Town, a residential facility for struggling teens. Paige Parkhurst also tried to commit suicide two times. Daisy says that after a while you start to believe what everyone else is saying. Paige felt so much guilt over what happened to Daisy even though it wasn't her fault for years. Paige says that it ate away at her every day. Her mother, Robert, her mother Robin Borland, says that she suffers from flashbacks, nightmares, and for a long time after the incident dragged her mattress into her brother's room at night. The boys who were present at the Barnett home that night seemed to have moved on with their lives as well. So, two of them were members of Northwest Missouri State University athletic teams and Matthew Barnett was in the was at the University of Central Missouri, his grandfather's alma mater. Matthew Barnett even made a tweet that expressed his views on women and their desire for his sexual attentions. He tweeted, if her name begins with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, H, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, then she wants the D. Wow. Aaron White also stated there was a lot of people without pointing any fingers running around while the case was active telling lies to benefit their cause by making a lot of things up and telling their stories about things that happened that never even existed. He goes on to say, don't underestimate the need for attention, especially with younger girls. And as sad as it is, there was pressure on girls in today's society to be pe pretty, to be popular, and though it may not be fair, that's how it works. Sheriff White says that everyone has seemed to blow it out of proportion. In this case, it seems that everyone wants to throw the word rape out there. He says that nothing that ever occurred that night rose to the elements of the crime of rape. He goes on to say that whether we agree with these charges or whether we agree with these findings or not, people of that age in the state of Missouri can have consensual sex. He says that forcible compulsion has to be within the crime for it to be considered rape, and it's just not there. So the producer of the documentary then says to Sheriff White, 
Then so forcible compulsion is not there when someone is unconscious or semi-unconscious and white stutters a little bit and replies after a while. That question is for lawyers and legislators to figure out, not him. When the case was reported by the Kansas City Star, the case exploded in the media. People talking about how corrupted Maryville was, how there was no justice in Maryville. This was when Anonymous entered the picture. On Monday, the hacker group Anonymous posted a video comparing Maryville to Steubenville, Ohio, where high school football players raped a 16-year-old girl. If Maryville won't defend these young girls, if the police are too cowardly or corrupt to do their jobs, if justice system has abandoned them, then someone else will have to stand for them. Mayor Jim Fall, your hands are dirty. Maryville, expect us. Anonymous founded in 2003. Recently became popular in the media for Operation Row Red Row. Greetings, citizens of the world. We are Anonymous. Around mid-August 2012, a party took place in a small town in Ohio known as Stubbenville. On this fateful night, a life was changed. Greetings, citizens of the world. We are Anonymous. Around mid-August 2012, a party took place in a small town in Ohio known as Stubbenville. On this fateful night, a life was changed forever as a group of the football players of Big Red High School began taking advantage of an underage girl. The girl was sexually assaulted, raped, and drug unconscious from party to party. The town of Stephenville has been good at keeping this quiet and their star football team protected. You can hide no longer. You now have the world looking directly at you. Pop roll, red roll, engaged. For calling out Steubenville, Ohio, for brushing under the rug the rape of a 16-year-old girl that was publicly raped and assaulted by Trent Mays and Malik Richmond, two star football players. On the fourth day of the trial, Jane Doe took the stand. She said she had a few drinks, a mixed drink, then a red Smirnoff ice drink and a red Solo cup with ice and started to feel funny. Jane Doe admits that she was interested in Brent Mays and followed him to another party because she trusted him. She was then showed a picture of her passed out, a picture she seen for the first time. She began crying. She, asked, she was asked how it made her feel. And she said, not good. As for the last thing that she remembers that night was leaving the last party with her friends behind her. A lot of people were leaving at that time, she said. The next morning, Jane Doe wakes up embarrassed, scared, not sure what to think, under a blanket in an unfamiliar place, naked on a couch, surrounded by three boys. She got up, got dressed, but was able, unable to find her underwear or her phone. Two friends picked her and the two defendants up after dropping off the defendants. Her friends began yelling at her over what they were hearing happened at the party. She was freaked out and embarrassed that she had blacked out and couldn't remember. Once dropped off at home, she immediately admitted everything to her mother. Getting in trouble was the last thing on my mind, she said. Only after being urged repeatedly did she go to the hospital two days later, but due to the amount of the time that had passed, the doctor told her a rape kit wouldn't show anything. She says the defendant texted her repeatedly over the next few days, freaking out, asking if she was going to the police. She did message Trent Mays after her parents had decided to go to the police. We know you didn't rape me, but she says she was unaware digital penetration was rape. The defendants kept texting her, asking her to tell the truth, that they had just taken care of her. But after seeing the video of Steubenville, Ohio athlete Michael Nadianos making fun of her, she thought differently. How dry is it? I'll, I'll leave it's so dry. I'm trying to take a sip from it. I don't die. <laughs> <laughs> if you need water, water, you need to get the shit out of here. That's how I'm going to 
Both Trent and Malik were found guilty. And if you would like to hear more about this case, watch the Netflix documentary Row Red Row, which will be linked below. Anonymous came forward saying that if justice was not done in this case, they would intervene. Using the hashtag OP Maryville, Anonymous came out with a video saying that the two young girls had been raped in the town of Maryville, Missouri. They go on to talk about how the grandson of a state official, the high school football star, has walked away free. They call for an investigation into how the case was handled. But citizens of Maryville soon grew very angry over how their small town was now being portrayed in the media. The Jackson County Prosecutor's Office, a prosecutor outside of the district, was put in charge of taking a second look at the case. Jane Peters Baker was the special prosecutor put in charge of the case. She says she received a phone call from a judge to which they mentioned Maryville and she knew immediately what he was about to ask and what it involved. She goes on to state that when a case is built on solely the testimony of a victim, those cases can be very, very hard. So she started trying to collect more evidence. She says there was nothing about the rape kit that gave them that aha moment. And then they went back to try and find the phone. Did it exist? Did it exist at one time? They were unsuccessful in that regard. And able to find the phone that held the video of the incident itself, it had disappeared. She says there was nothing about the... The producer of the documentary asked her what the state of the case was when it was handed to her and she states I just don't think I want to answer that question so I believe and I'm sure you guys do too that we can draw our own conclusions by what she means by that seems Sheriff White who was so quick to pay, pat himself on the back may not have done such a good job of packing this case up as tightly and tying it with the pretty little bow that he said he did she says after examining all the evidence and looking at everything, the only charge that she thought would be able to go forward on and have the evidence to try was endangering the welfare of a child, to which Matthew Barnett pled guilty and was sentenced to two years of probation. A case that grabbed national attention and drew hundreds of activists to this courthouse for a rally last fall ended today with just two words. Yes, sir, 19-year-old Matthew Barnett told a judge. He understood he was pleading guilty to one count of child endangerment. The special prosecutor appointed to the case last October explained. And my job is to analyze evidence. In this case, it was there was insufficient evidence to go forward on a sexual assault. Barnett's lawyer went further. further there's absolutely no evidence that political favoritism played a role in the decision of either prosecutor. He said his client would abide by the conditions of his probation. No alcohol, 100 hours of community service, and an apology and restitution to the family to cover counseling costs. The victim's mother says her daughter has been the target of vicious online bullying since that night two years ago, pushing them out of town and her daughter to twice attempt to take her own life. Today, neither mother nor daughter came to Maryville, but the victim sent a statement in support of today decision with the prosecutor. To all of those who supported me, I promise that what happened on January the 8th of 2012 will not define me forever. Sheriff Darren White, of course, has something else to say, and he says that he can tell the boys in this case were that were at the Barnett home that night were the only ones who wanted to move on and make something of themselves. He says, and now this is a and now remember that this is a father of two girls. He says, I, he says that this is one of the fatal flaws in our society, that it's always the boys. It's not always the boys, he says, to which the producer of the documentary says, but in this case, it was the boys 
who committed the crime? And Darren White replies, was it? And chuckles. D uh, he just, oh my God, this guy hurts me so bad. Linda Cohen says that in a Facebook post, my daughter has been terrorized to the point she tried to kill herself last night. She may never be okay. In 2014, when Charlie Coleman found her, found his sister lifeless on their bathroom floor, Melinda says that Daisy almost hit. Melinda says that Daisy hid inside herself, that she dyed her hair black, shaved one side of her head, and through tears, Melinda says that she was even burning herself. Melinda says that their home had no doors on the upstairs because of all the times that Daisy had tried to overdose and take her life. Daisy was named as one of the 13 most fearless teens of 2013. Daisy also the original founder of Safe Bay, a nonprofit organization aimed at ending sexual assaults in schools, went on to attend Missouri Valley College and become a tattoo artist. A quite talented one at that. After many failed suicide attempts, a lot of therapy working on herself for countless hours, she decided it was in her best interest and best for her mental health that she relocated to Colorado Springs, Colorado, where she worked as a tattoo artist and focused on the sequel to the Audrey and Daisy documentary, Saving Daisy, which focuses on her recovery process, PTSD, and the use of CBD and EMDR treatment. Charlie Coleman became a Little League baseball coach. He says it's not something he ever seen himself doing, but the young boys on his team have almost been a blessing to him. Charlie also has a beautiful baby girl and recently became engaged last year with his mother and his brother there to celebrate the wonderful day with him. Tristan Coleman and Melinda Coleman were on their way back from back home to Sugar Creek, Missouri on June 18, 2018 from moving Daisy to Colorado Springs when they were involved in a vehicle collision in Oakley, Kansas. Tristan did not survive the crash. He was only 19 years old. Tristan had just graduated high school in 2017 with honors from Albany High School. He worked as a vet tech and at Northeast Animal Hospital and plans to start college the next year for a degree in vet medicine. He spent the last year of his life caring for and working with his mother, Melinda Coleman. Inducted into the National Honor Society his sophomore year. He w was the founder of Warriors for Christ. The group did charitable work and worked for nonprofit organizations. He also spoke to high school students about sexual assault consent in Title IX. He was described as an impressive and inspirational person who truly loved people and wanted to make the world a better place. He enjoyed wrestling, working out, his family, and animals. He often took food and money to the homeless, and even on the day he passed, he stopped to make sure a homeless mother of five children had breakfast and money. Tristan said he was blessed to help others. He, got, he forgave easily and loved even those who sought to hurt him. Tristan was Daisy's best friend. Passing was like adding fuel to the already burning fire that was blazing deep inside of her. Daisy made an Instagram post. I don't want this to be real. I can't breathe or even think. I tried so hard. You were so excited to live with me your senior year. You were always the one right by my side. We went through eating phase together. You always wanted to make things okay for everyone else. I should have hugged you longer. We went to every warped tour together. Every year, I would sell my soul to be on the couch with you again, watching cops or listening to peepers. You fought for so hard for so long. It was also said that in 2020, Daisy had received threats and was being stalked home, and she was terrified. Daisy was also told in 2020 that she may not be able to have children, possibly due to the assault that had occurred years before. And I know as a woman, not being able to have a child makes you feel almost less than. As crazy as that sounds, it truly does. And this was just adding another thing to what Daisy was already going through in her life. Losing her father, her brother, now a chance to be a mother, and also having so many people against her and having a stalker that she had to worry about daily. August 4, 2020, Melinda Coleman contacted Oklahoma City Police Department and asked them to do a welfare check on her daughter, Daisy. 
She told him that she feared that Daisy was in a mindset that she may take her life. And spoke with Daisy for a little over an hour and said there was no reason to believe that Daisy was a threat to herself or to others, so they left. Later that day, Catherine Daisy Coleman took her own life. Melinda Coleman wrote later on a post on Facebook, My daughter, Catherine Daisy Coleman, committed suicide tonight. If you saw crazy messages or posts, it was because I called the police to check on her. She was my best friend and an amazing daughter. I think she had to make it seem that I could live without her, but I can't. I wish I could have taken the pain from her. She never recovered from what those boys did to her, and it's just not fair. My baby girl is gone. Melinda Cohen stood by her statement that she could not live without her daughter. Only four months later, Melinda took her own life in December of 2020. Melinda was a passionate mother, a lover of animals, gifted veterinarian, a devoted wife, and a talented bodybuilder. More than anything, she loved and believed in her children. The bottomless grief of losing her husband, her son, and her daughter was more than she could face. Charlie Coleman and his younger brother are the only two remaining survivors of the Coleman family, but they carry on their family story, refusing to let their story die or to let their work stop. Producers of the Saving Daisy film say they will still be coming out with, a sa with the film, that they will finish this for Daisy. Charlie is still an advocate for sexual assault. I will be doing a second part to this video telling the stories of these two young ladies as well as a few others. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please make sure you stay safe on April the 24th if you don't know what's going on. Um, a lot of pedophiles and rapists are trying to deem it National Rape Day, so please just stay safe. Go out only in groups and try to stay in. Make sure you also show your support this month for survivors wearing your distressed jeans and posting your sexual assault survivor monthly post on your social media as always guys love yourselves love others and i love you now here is a tribute to daisy and audrey and all other victims and survivors of sexual assault why do I feel like I'm losing all control? control. Sounds are fading, can't speak, where did you go? I'm screaming, can you hear me now? now. Tell me, can you hear me? It was a typical night, not much to do Her and her friend just hanging out in a room And they were never the cool girls in school Someone texted them, they didn't know what to do Said that they were just chilling and watching Netflix He said that we got some liquor, come and kick it And he was older, they didn't think for a second He would ever want to hang with them, especially some freshmen But who knows, maybe he'll think that we're cool And when we go back to school, they will look at us differently, right? She asked, she said she was down they said cool and they picked them up around the corner A little tipsy already cause they had been drinking some vodka That they found in the liquor cabinet earlier They had never really drank so needless to say The thought of drinking too much had never occurred to them Snuck out the house and got in the car They said the house isn't too far away So they parked and then they walked a little bit Before they snuck into the window of one of the kids' basements The coolest kids on the football team And it was five of them all laughing it seemed like Everything was all good enough Poured the liquor said he got a drink out of the bitch cup now She was game then didn't want to seem like she couldn't hang so she drank it all down and then she swigged the bottle by the time she looked around and couldn't find a friend and thought that something wasn't right and started feeling awful that's where it all gets hazy she remembers being picked up and carried to a room it all started going fuzzy fading in and out she came two weeks on top of her with his friends around no stop what are you doing quit playing she couldn't really move and she was so drunk but she kept saying it she kept saying it he put his hand into her pants she didn't know what he was doing she said it again tried to push it away and she said no but her eyes would barely open up and she just couldn't move around Felt him take off her shirt and couldn't tell But it looked like his friend had started filming too Heard the sound of his voice Breath on her neck Felt his hand push her down And that's it It went black Tape cut right there She don't remember anything after that
She woke up to the sound of her mom shaking her. Her front yard, 5 a.m. in the middle of winter. Said the temperature was 21 degrees, and her hair had almost been completely frozen to the concrete. Still hazy when she walked back inside. She remembers that she kept on asking if she's alright then. Took her clothes off to put her in the bath. Saw some marks on her body, and that said she'd been attacked. But she couldn't really even put words together. In the whole room was spinning, she just started crying. crying. The next thing she remembers, the doctor asking her questions, and even now it's really hard to recollect it. They said rape, and now the cops are showing up. Asking where she was last night and what happened, but still in shock. Her brother had found her phone with all the people she had texted last night in the snow. They took him into custody and made the news. A small town football player had been accused of sexual assault. She didn't know what it was called and really felt like it was her fault. The next day at school, she was outcast. The whole student body, they had heard about it. And she just wanted to pretend it didn't happen But the word of this video, it got around They called the sluts and she was a lying bitch Motherfuck would she accuse someone like him to get attention And even if she wasn't lying, she probably wanted it And if she didn't, she should have drank and learned her lessons This all feels like a real bad dream And everybody keeps staring, it seems like She can still feel the spots where he touched her Her life is over, how can anybody love her now? And even adults think she's making this up And all the friends she did have are too afraid to speak up Pray to God that this will just go away And she keeps counting the days until the this court case is over. Just a little validation. Said she ruined his life. It's amazing. amazing. I let these thoughts just run all day and go to sleep now. The only way to escape it. Charges were dropped against two teens accused of sexual assault. The county prosecutor says he did not believe he could prove the allegations against the two teens beyond a reasonable doubt. She woke up to the sound of her mom screaming first Said they let them all walk, thought she was dreaming first They were kids and had the whole life ahead of them And not to let some little mistake and a girl threatened it Plus the dad was a senator with connections Just boys being boys, they had all learned their lessons Couldn't believe it, she just wanted justice And more than that, she just wanted them to admit it But she was disregarded And then the backlash, they had her name attached to slut Made in the hashtags Up on Twitter, the notifications blew up Saying she should kill herself, that she deserved it And then from that night and all the court dates since Could have prepared for the hurt those words did Sick of crying and being under a microscope And having her womanhood be the topic of the conversation Half the town thinks he's innocent Happy to get him back on the field so they can win again Turn the computer off and chuck the phone Like what the fuck happened to my life Cause I don't know but Future ruined the reputation is nothing And she keeps taking all of these pills But it don't numb it She said fuck it for the last time Last time. Maybe these people on Facebook are right Grabbed the bell she found in the top drawer Then she took it to her bathroom to tie it up could barely see through the tears, but she kept hearing people call her liar as she stepped on the lip of the tub. You don't know how dark this life gets. Sick of living her whole life in regret. So she took a deep breath, closed her eyes, and then she stepped. Why do I feel like I'm losing all control? Time's fading, can't speak. Where did you go? I'm screaming, can you hear me now? Tell me, can you hear me? Why do I feel like I'm losing all control? Time's fading, can't speak. Where did you go? I'm screaming, can you hear me now? Tell me, can you hear me? Old in the front yard, mama standing over me. Trying to figure out why I don't remember anything And then the air grew thick and the ice grew thicker I could feel the shift, my heart rate getting quicker All of a sudden, the camera started coming All I'm asking is
Someone to take these boulders off my shoulders for someone to be the scapegoat. The white 